Hello, okay. my name is Sarah Reinevel, Chair of the 36. We are joined today by Judge Dillon, who is running for District Court. Judge, please go ahead with your two-minute introduction. Thank you so much. And again, thanks so much for interviewing me for this position. So my name is Judge Cole Jinder Dillon. I'm uh, asking for your endorsement to retain my position as King County District Court Judge for the West Division, downtown Seattle. I was unanimously appointed to the um, bench by the King County Council on July 21st of 2021. I'm the first South Asian woman appointed to the bench in Washington State. I've been rated as exceptionally well qualified by six bar associations and one, one well qualified uh, rating. I've been endorsed by numerous uh, judges in Superior Court, Court of Appeals, and um, all of the district court judges. I've lived in Washington State for 31 years. I'm the daughter of East Indian immigrants who left India to find work and opportunities to build a better life for themselves. My parents settled in England in the 1960s. My family faced discrimination because of how they looked, what they wore, and how they sounded. My father drove the city bus and my mother was a seamstress and raised three children. My parents were able to afford their low-income house with grants from the government. My parents instilled values of hard work, education, and giving back to the community. For the last 31 years, I have given back to the community that I've lived in. I've worked as a public defense attorney for uh, almost 17 years prior to being appointed to the bench. For the last three years of those 17 years, I worked as a pro tem for the King County District Court and seconds. served in all of the divisions. I've also worked in the area of victim advocacy advocacy and worked at the King County Prosecutor's Office, and I've worked in other organizations in King County. Thank you. We will start with our prepared questions, and Alice has the first question she will post in the chat. What are the elements of your background and experience that make you best qualified to earn our endorsement? Thank you. Um, I've been working as a King County judge now uh, for about six months prior to uh, being on the bench, I served as a pro tem judge. So I've worked in all of the divisions of the King County Court. I have been able to handle numerous um, case, sorry, uh, voluminous calendars. As you may know, the district court has very high volume caseloads and I'm managed to handle those caseloads for the last few years. I've worked in all of the divisions. Um, I have a background in um, a varied background. I've worked in the criminal justice system as well as outside. I've worked as a victim advocate and I have um, for the King County Prosecutor's Office. I'm currently have just been assigned to be the domestic violence court judge. So I'll be sitting as the regional domestic violence court judge. So I'm able to bring my background in all of those areas together. I also have a background with working with juveniles and um, I've had trainings on the national level regarding adolescent brain science. Um, I've also handled um, large caseloads as a public defender. And I also know the systems within King County, which I think is really important as a judge. It really helps um, when I'm on the bench to understand what the public defense lawyers and private lawyers um, are talking about. So that's, um, I think, is a real strength on my part. Thank you. Ethan has our next question. Um, in what ways can the courts better serve those of moderate or low financial means in civil actions? Thanks so much for that question. It's definitely an area where we see a lot of barriers that folks face given that there's not the right to counsel in civil cases. So some of the civil rules in district court do allow the judges not necessarily to help 
uh, pro se litigants, but we they are relaxed, the rules are relaxed. And so there's more of a process of communicating with unrepresented people in the civil arena. I um, also, my um, duties right now are in domestic violence court three days a week. The other days I'm actually doing some civil work. I sit on the civil um, small claims matters. And you may know that the small claims matters are actually do not allow for um, attorneys to be in that arena unless they have prior approval from judges. And so a lot of the work with uh, in the civil arena um, in small claims is collaborative. And we're really lucky that the court rules recently have changed and they allow the um, dispute resolution center to help mediate some of those issues. So that's been a really important step in some of the civil uh, actions to help uh, pro se litigants um, understand the rules and, and offer some mediation and offer a path that's short of going to trial. But in terms of what the court can do to better serve those people, I think putting on free um, clinics on how to um, bring your case forward and, uh, would be really beneficial to for pro se litigants. And I wish there, there was a, uh, similar to the Superior Court in District Court, a um, forum for pro se litigants. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Barbara has our third question, which has been posted in the chat. If uh, presiding over a criminal docket, what role do you think judges should take and would you take if any in diverting defendants to diversion programs such as drug court, mental health court, or other diversion programs, um, or other alternatives to incarceration? Thank you. Oftentimes, um, the judges don't necessarily have a role in diverting cases. Those decisions are made by the prosecutor's office if a case is worthy of being diverted from the system. Um, and, but what I will say that in my prior role, I was actually defense counsel in, in King County Superior Court's juvenile drug court. And it was a, a really important program, is a really important program. I've also worked as a practitioner in King County's Superior Court adult um, drug court program. And I think it's a great, I love collaborative courts. I think it's definitely the way of the future that there can be a path out of the criminal justice system without necessarily convictions for certain crimes. Um, and I'm, I wholeheartedly support diversion court, diversion courts and specialty courts. I think that one size fits all doesn't really work for people and for complex problems such as mental health and or poverty based. Um, I think barriers based on poverty definitely stop people from accessing services. And if the court can have different stakeholders who are able to provide certain treatment and or therapy within the confines of a diversion program and or a specialty court, um, I think that we've seen some of our best solutions in that area. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And Laura has our next and last prepared question. What is your position on bail reform? What factors do you or would you consider when deciding whether to impose bail? And what changes would you advocate for, if any, if elected? Thank you for the question. So as you've probably heard previously, the all judges have to apply rule 3.2 in the district court. It's criminal rule for courts of local jurisdiction 3.2 in um, felony matters in superior court, which I also do sit on for release decisions. It's um, criminal rule 3.2. They're very similar rules. And 
the presumption in the state of Washington for uh, cases, but, but capital, capital cases, is the presumption of release unless there is um, are certain factors that the court has to consider. Number one, whether the person is likely to uh, not return to court or interfere with witnesses or the administration of justice and or is likely to make a I'm sorry, commit a violent crime in the future, and the court has to make a finding that the person is likely to commit a violent crime in the future. So um, in terms of um, my role currently, I sit on the domestic violence bench. And so in terms of domestic violence cases, there are some, the rule does allow me to can take other factors into consideration. Some of the factors that I take into consideration in domestic violence cases are the research that's been done in the state of Washington and nationally on lethality factors in domestic violence cases. And so that is another added factor that I do look at. Um, so, in terms of my position on bail reform, I think that King County has made some One second. big, thank you, some um, some strides in the right direction. To, and especially with COVID over the last few years, we have um, because of COVID, under the guise of COVID, we've reduced our jail population by specifically following the rule. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, those are prepared questions, and uh, we will now open it up to the executive board for uh, any questions they'd like to ask you, and the responses to these are one minute. Thank so you. I've got a question, um, and it, you talked a little bit about this when you talked about your domestic violence um, court um, placement, but what rotations on the bench are you particularly interested in, um, in experiencing or being a part of? Thank you. I'm um, truly honored to have been asked to go to domestic violence court. It's um, it's a regional court, all of the different divisions. So e the east side, um, the west and the south, all of those cases go to one regional court that I'm now presiding over. It was a goal that I thought that I would apply for in about a year or two after being on the bench, but I was just asked about two weeks to two or three weeks ago to start. So it's um, a truly an honor. And this was something I really wanted to do. Um, in terms of other areas on the bench that I'm really interested in, um, you know, I am interested in expanding my knowledge of the civil rules. I think it's really important. My background is primarily in criminal, but over the last few years, I've worked on uh, other civil matters. So I'm interested in, um, in learning more about the civil arena. Thanks. Thank you. Other questions? What is your approach um, with working with unrepresented litigants or defendants in your courtroom? Thanks for the question. I think it's a really important question. I think the public at this stage, as well as, um, sorry, the public wants judges who treat litigants, who whether they're represented or represented with fairness and with compassion. And I think that that is my approach always to treat someone with dignity and um, being as, you know, I do a lot of self-reflection and I try to set aside my biases and I um, always treat litigants with courtesy. Um, in terms of unrepresented folks, I do very thorough colloquies about whether a person should be unrepresented and make sure that they understand um, what they're taking on as being unrepresented. And especially with populations who use interpreters, I try very, very carefully to make them understand and, and give them information that they're not being charged um, financially 
for having an inter, uh, having a, an attorney. I think that's really important to um, have that perspective as well to make sure litigants from other countries and other cultures understand that they're not being charged for public defense. Thank you. Any other questions? I have one that I can jump in. Um, sure. So how do you define restorative justice? And, uh, you know, in the work that you're doing now, particularly in the domestic violence space, how do you incorporate those principles? It's a really interesting question. Um, in terms of the restorative justice itself. I definitely believe in the principles. And I think that in my prior work in juvenile drug court, and um, I, I've been sort of seen that work firsthand. Uh, we incorporated a lot of the work that we did um, into um, juvenile court of restorative justice. We had uh, folks who have been harmed, um, the victim of a crime, um, oftentimes work with the court and the prosecutor's office to have some input on what the just outcome would be so that they felt whole and it wasn't necessarily a punishment, uh, so to speak, for the person who had committed the crime. So in terms of domestic violence, seconds. thank you. It's not necessarily an arena at this point where we can necessarily in the criminal arena, domestic violence cases have restorative justice. But I do think that how I use those principles in my work is to always listen to victims of, and survivors of domestic violence and what their input is through their advocate. And I always ask questions when they're present or on the Zoom platform. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? So I have a question. This is Barbara, and um, uh, so I I don't work in the legal field, so this may be a sort of naively uh, put. But um, congratulations on your is it an appointment to the domestic violence court? And I um, I'm fascinated by the fact that you were tagged for that in you know with, within the last couple of weeks, and I. Uh, I'd really appreciate hearing more about that. Uh, what, why you think you may have been um, identified for that, and what you know, how you can contribute to that um, through your experience and you know your um, your views about it. So um, I'm fascinated by the fact that you were tagged, and I congratulate you for it. Thank you so much for that. Um, well, first of all, um, it's a rotation that um, that I, I'm not sure how long it's going to be. I've been told it's temporary, but we'll we'll see. Um, uh, the judge who was in domestic violence court is assuming other duties. Uh, they've become our assistant presiding judge, and so I'm filling their position. But we'll we'll see if it become if I'm temporarily there or full or whether it becomes full time. Um, so in terms of um, why I believe I was chosen, I think a lot of my uh, I think that there are several judges who know me. Uh, know the work that I've done in that arena. So I think that that helped um, seconds. helped people think about the who would be a good fit. I think that it's important too that you have a calm demeanor in that um, arena and someone who can work with um, different stakeholders who sit at the table in domestic violence court and somebody who also understands working with victim survivors and in that context. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think we have time for a couple more questions. If there are any more. Uh, I'm happy to jump in. Uh, how would you further access to equity and justice in the judicial system? And can you give us examples of what you've specifically done to ensure access to justice, particularly because district court is oftentimes, you know, the first interaction that people will have with the judicial system. Sure. 
So I currently sit on the board of the Judicial Institute, and it's an organization that works with um, to, well, it works to promote a diverse uh, judicial system and uh, bench. And so we just recently finished our three-day clinic uh, where we had, um, I think, 20 um, lawyers who wish to be judges and the diversity uh, covers all forms of diversity. And so that was really fulfilling and inspiring. So I'm doing doing that work. And in the past, in terms of equity um, and inclusion work, I've um, worked with the Washington seconds. Women Lawyers on their um, um, working to look at why what barriers with female judges have in the le I'm sorry, female um, attorneys have in the legal system. I also work as a mentor or I am a mentor to um, a few BIPOC um, and women. Time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any final questions for Judge Dillon? Going once, <laughs> going twice. <laughs> All right. If you could give us your one minute closing. Sure. Thank you. So as I said, I've been working every day since um, August of 2021 to work uh, with my colleagues on the backlog in King County District Court from the pandemic. I've also been working with my colleagues to administer the court. And it, it was something that I don't think that you understand until you're on the bench, how much work it takes to administer the court. And I look forward to continuing to administer the court with my colleagues. I'm on the personnel committee. We're currently looking at our anti-harassment policy. Um, and I'm really excited about uh, also looking at structural barriers and specifically some of the policies um, that may have bias and racism embedded in them. So I look forward to your endorsement and thank you so much again for this, um, for giving your time to this important process. Thank you so much. Thank you for thank joining you.